we tend to think of the Millennium Development Goals. And uh, the Millennium Development Goal on food security is, is seriously off track. According to FAO estimates, more than 1 billion people were food insecure last year. So uh, climate change is obviously not going to make that easier to get back on track. So it's gone off track already. This gives a, a broad illustration of where the hotspots are likely to be in terms of food security without going into any detail here. But you can see that um, many parts of sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia are among the worst affected. And it's uh, interesting that these are the areas that are actually chosen by the challenge program for their targets. I'll just briefly go through the three, what we see as the three main areas of interaction between climate change and food security. On the one hand, climate change will impact on the availability and access to food. It will create a need to adapt, both in terms of current variability and also approaching new thresholds, and the question whether mitigation actually presents new opportunities for some of the farmers that are suffering the impacts of, of climate change. I won't go through this in detail because most people here will know better than me about these impacts, but there is quite a large range of impacts, including temperature, precipitation, sea level rise, uh, and the sort of secondary impacts that these will have on, on land and water availability. Glacial melt is a particularly serious problem in some parts of the world as it affects river basins on which uh, more than a billion people depend. Um, an important point of view from our developmental perspective is where the impacts of climate change are likely to be most seriously felt and by whom they are likely to be most seriously felt. Um, developing countries operating close to, often operating agricultural systems close to thresholds are much more vulnerable to relatively small changes of temperature or precipitation regime. And of course, agricultural systems depend on, on, on rainfall and temperature regimes for their productivity and sustainability. And of course, the poor within those countries are, are likely to suffer more than those who are better off and who have other alternatives. And the poor, of course, are not a homogeneous group either. In some circumstances, women might suffer more or particularly socially excluded groups who might be less mobile or the landless who often depend on agricultural labor. Um, now, all this is very complex, which, of course, is why we need a, a challenge program and even a mega program to, uh, to tackle it. Um, because a number of par parameters are changing um, simultaneously. We need to know when, where, and by how much these are changing and who, who is most affected. And we're dealing not with certainties, with probabilities. So it's very difficult in planning adaptation strategies to know what to plan um, because you, you, you're not certain exactly what's going to happen and where. And changes, of course, are often uh, dramatic and uh, sudden rather than gradual. Um, this is a, one projection of, uh, in this case, irrigated rice production up to 2050, and it shows, according to this particular model, a net decrease in global production of 27% and a shift in suitable areas. So it's interesting when you superimpose some of these projections on your MDG targets, it really highlights the, the magnitude of the challenge we are facing. Again, some ideas of approaches to adaptation that I'm sure this particular program will... Uh, we'll look into in a lot of uh, detail in the coming years. Um, mitigation, a huge potential for mitigation through agriculture and land use change. But the, the target group, the poor smallholder farmer, has one of the lowest carbon footprints in the world. So one must approach this issue from the perspective of development. Does 
a market for ecosystem services, as Akim Steiner just pointed out, does that create opportunities for poor farmers who are custodians of some of these public, public goods, soils and forests, which are absolutely vital for uh, limiting dangerous climate change. So in looking at how to approach mitigation, we should be very careful, I think, about um, how we structure market-based incentives uh, in terms of, of who gains, who has access, um, how we make sure they don't backfire because of elite capture or by um, encouraging land use practices that might not ultimately achieve the goals we want to achieve. And of course, there are synergies. We need to build on these synergies, but also recognize trade-offs when they are present. Um, just to give some idea of the scope for um, agriculture and land use change to contribute, and forestry as well in this case, to contribute to, uh, to mitigation. This is a projection by, by McKinsey from a, a, a project called Catalyst, which does a lot of this detailed modeling. And just to draw your attention to this figure of, okay, the target of 17 gigatons of avoided emissions is uh, linked to a target of keeping global warming within a two degree centigrade um, increase. And, and to do that, um, according to this model, you need to uh, reduce, you need to limit your, you need to achieve a net saving of 17 gigatons in carbon dioxide um, emissions. And of that 17, the potential for achieving nine of them is through terrestrial carbon, through forestry and agriculture. And the actual graph shows unit cost against the type of intervention. And most of the agriculture, forestry, land use change interventions are relatively low cost um, as opposed to some of the other technological approaches such as wind and solar. So how does the international community respond to this? There's been a lot of uh, high-level meetings, a lot of... Uh, encouraging commitments both from the perspective of food security and the perspective of climate change, figures of billions of dollars mentioned. Now, how do we make sure we maximize these opportunities and how do we also make sure we have the right synergies between them at, at the policy level and at the funding instrument level? Um, Dr. Steiner mentioned that uh, agriculture had to get out of its silo. I also read that climate change needs to be very clearly beyond an environmental silo as well so that it is mainstreamed into all important high-level policies. Um, the EU is, has recently developed a strategy on food security, how to assist developing countries in facing food security challenges. I won't dwell on this, but it does emphasis availability, access, nutrition, and also importantly, um, disaster reduction and crisis prevention. And of course, also recognizing country ownership and country specificity of, of, uh, of strategies. If we focus in on one aspect of this, uh, of this policy, um, the one dealing with availability of food, we put a great stress on smallholder farmers and on ecological efficiency in agriculture because I think we recognize that we cannot go on with the business-as-usual model ad infinitum. We need to look at um, ways of using con increasingly constrained natural resources more efficiently we also took, we we're also talking about increasing support to demand-led agricultural research for development, uh, very much linked up to extension and innovation systems. And we are currently um, setting a tentative target of a 50% increase in spending by 2015. Um, research can't solve the problems at its own, on it by itself, of course. We need 
much greater participation, working together with civil society and farmers' organizations, and the role of the private sector in the value chain is, of course, very important without going into details. Um, just a few of the initiatives which are led by the European Commission. A food facility responding to uh, short to medium term threats. The food security thematic program which includes support to the CGIAR. Uh, the Global Climate Change Alliance which comes from our, env from our environmental funding instrument. The European Development Fund which supports activities at the country level and also some intra country and regional work, the framework program coming out of the Directorate General of Research and Development, and a new joint programming initiative led at the moment by the UK and France, um, and with some coordination from the Commission. And European perspectives on agricultural research for development, um, the public goods argument, part of innovation system, demand-driven, and taking into account traditional knowledge as well as new technologies, we feel this is very important. Recognizing the importance of, of the global ARD system with GFAR, the Global Forum for Agricultural Research, is the apex institution, and the CGIAR is probably the most important public sector supplier of international ARD public goods. Um, and Europe is the of the regions, it has the biggest proportional budgetary support to the CGIAR. And of course, we are fully committed to the current reforms, including the, uh, the strategic results framework and the mega programs. So where does um, CCAFs fit in, and, and how do we feel it should, um, it should approach the, the, these problems? And, and of course, Bruce will talk in much more detail after coffee. What time is it, by the way? Um, okay, building understanding of problems, providing evidence for policies, um, piloting activities, including in the field with, with those who are most likely to be affected, and then having a, a clear vision of how intermediate results relate to eventual impacts both on, uh, well, on poverty, on food security, and on environmental sustainability. And we're very uh, honored to be um, spearheading the first mega program of the reformed CGIAR. So I don't know whether that's an advantage or a disadvantage, but you will certainly learn from experience over the next few months and indeed the next couple of years. We would see it as a progressive expansion building on the success of the challenge program. We cannot overemphasize the importance of innovative partnerships in actually delivering results and impacts and uh, it has to integrate with the whole CGIR system. You know, I think that's well recognized of course. And the current donors, as far as I'm aware, are the European Commission, Canada, Denmark, and the World Bank. And we're very pleased to be associated with this program. Thank you very much. Thank you.